Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Pizza Expo 2019. Yeah? <laughs> we are here to talk about management incentives. So I'm going to begin by giving you a CNN version of myself, a little bit of background so that hopefully you can understand where I'm coming from and take that advice in stride. <laughs> to begin with, I began ooh, back in the 1989 bringing my crew here to learn at Pizza Expo. So I've been here longer than Pete LaChapelle and all the rest of his crew. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just ran into somebody today who worked for me back in 89, John Cavey. And John brought that back to memory of how we came in the crew back when the rooms had 50 people in them and there was only about 2,000 people total attending the expo. So this has grown tremendously. And just to show you how Many people come to this for the first time. How many people are single store operators? Look around, show of hands, people who have just one location. Isn't that tremendous? That's what this show began, that's, it. that's the roots of this show. It wasn't designed for the big chains. It was designed for people who had a job in a pizzeria and how can we turn that job into a business? That's, what, that's the roots of Pizza Expo. Well, I worked for a company for 20, 15 years before becoming a franchisee for that company for 10 years. So 25 years with the same company. In 2012, we rebranded those restaurants to my current name, Pizza Man Dan's. We are what used to be the definition of fast casual. And that is, we have dine-in, we have delivery, people come up to the counter, place their order, go sit down, and we get the food out to them with a runner or we just call their name. I guess the new definition of fast casual is this... Uh, uh, I don't know, Blaze style that people are calling, that's the new definition. But we are the traditional fast casual pizzeria. We have a one number phone center. We're located in Ventura County, which is about an hour north of Los Angeles. So I've got about 35 years in pizza. And Pizza Expo didn't come to me to give this talk because I am great at keeping people. But something has happened accidentally, which I have learned from. So why did they come to me? They came to me because they discovered that I have manage managers working for me for 30 years. They came to me because the most recent manager that's working for me has been with me for two years. And we call that a very new person in our organization. Now, we still have the turnover in the regular crew. But my leadership team, I would put up against anybody in the world, in the pizza business. They're that good. So how does that happen? Well, I was talking to uh, Via 313 and about company culture and discovered that they were intentional about company culture. I've never been intentional about it. When I, when I started my own pizzerias, I just decided, well, you know, I don't like the rigidity of saying you can't have your phone at work, the rigidity of saying you can't have your kids sitting in the dining room. I'm like, hey, this is part of life, right? So let's integrate that whole process. And I just felt that that was an unintentional culture that came about. But because I've had people with me for so long and had the opportunity to discover why they stay, I've put together some ideas on that. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. Let's begin with the acronym that I'm going to use, MORE. Because that's really what it comes down to, is managers want more. If you're going to turn over the reins of your business to somebody that you have to trust, what are the components, what are the attributes of these people? What are they looking for so that they will stay with you long term? And I say they want more. First of all, you have to address the big, the elephant in the room, right? The big issue, money. You have to address that because otherwise they cannot afford to stay working with you. The second thing we're going to talk about today is opportunity because everybody in life is looking for opportunity, aren't they? Then we're going to talk about responsibility because we feel like we're accomplishing something when we're given more responsibility. Are you the owner, right? That we, fe we feel like we are growing in life when we're given more responsibility and we can prove ourselves. And finally, education. Managers are looking for education because none of us want to be static. We want to continue to grow and learn because that's what life is. So we're going to talk about each of these today, but I also believe in something. I was telling somebody earlier, I learn more from my talks than I do from going to somebody else's talk because I have the opportunity 
after those talks and throughout the course of the year from, from people in the, these seminars emailing me and asking questions, I have the opportunity to learn from you. And learn from you means it's not just everybody has great ideas, but when you implement those ideas and you say, man, this worked, that's something that I can learn from, something I can bring back to my team and my leaders so they can share it with their crew. So as we go through each of these, we have plenty of time. We're only hitting on four points today. We're gonna to have an opportunity to share. So for each of these points, I'm, I'm list, I want you to consider whether you have something tremendous that has worked in your organization that would benefit this whole room. We'll also take questions throughout the course if something needs to be clarified. But I am available afterwards since we only have that hour. Limit the questions only to things that might help the entire audience. And I'm available after it for as long as you need. So let's get into this with money, shall we? All right. People often ask me, how much should your restaurant manager make? And I like to have a very definitive answer when people ask me a direct question. My definitive answer is 4% of total sales. It's, it's a number, you can work with it. Now that's gonna be a challenge when you have a location that's only doing $500,000 a year, isn't it? Because 4% isn't enough money for that person to report to work. But it's a general rule of thumb that you can start from. So if you think about it, a million dollar restaurant, $40,000 a year, $2 million restaurant, $80,000 a year, $3 million restaurant, $120,000 a year. Eh, it's, a, it's, it's something to start with, all right? In addition to that, you'll want to structure their program so that I say one-fifth, 20% of their base wage is available for a bonus program. So if they are a million dollar restaurant, making $40,000 a year, 20% of that, how does that work out to? Where's the math people in the room, $8,000? Up to $8,000 a year in bonus. So there's a pretty good structure on how you can pay the manager, the general manager, the person you're putting in charge of everything inside those four walls, so that you can either go to the beach and have a margarita, build your second restaurant, or get some time off to spend with your family, right? Somebody that you can trust. So, rule of thumb to begin with. How do we structure the bonus program? I always believe that you structure it on your controllables. The two biggest controllables, of course, food and labor as far as costs, and the biggest controllable on the revenue side is the top line, the sales. So if you measure those things, and I always believe in measuring it this year to last year, right? For the first year, you don't have that. You can measure it to last month. But because we may have some trends in the business, let's compare it this year to last year and see how they're doing as far as food, labor, and sales. So we can structure it that way. Very specifically, what we do in our organization is if they hit their food cost, we know what the ideal food cost is. If they hit that number, that's $200 towards their bonus for every month, let's say. Their labor cost, well, labor is always gonna fall in a range, so you can do a range and, and reward them accordingly. You might start at 50 bucks, go up to 500, depending on how aggressive they are with the labor cost. And then finally, sales, the third component of that bonus program, sales. So let's say that we look at it and say, we just wanna at least beat last year. So if you beat last year, eh, we say, okay, you get 100 bucks. If you beat last year by 10%, we go to 300 bucks. You beat last year by 20%, 500 bucks, somewhere along the way. And you can pick the numbers that work for your, your business. But that's how we structure the bonus program within Pizza Man Dan's. I would be remiss to not at least take a look at crew incentives before we talk about this as a group. Uh, crew incentives, primarily we're after management incentives. And I believe that that's going to be the most important thing that you do. But you should also give that manager the power to incentivize their crew using something. Whether that's cash, it could be food. If you don't give your employees free food, then possibly free food can be an incentive. It could be movie tickets, it could be lottery tickets, something along those lines. But I also believe that your manager should be given the authority and the responsibility of rewarding their crew in some way, generally non-monetarily. Let's keep the money for the leader of the organization. All right. Now in larger companies I've seen, well, two million plus, yes, they're going to have multiple layers that they need to reward monetarily, and so they may move that on to the, the lead supervisors. 
front of the kitchen, front of the house, back of the house type of people. So they may incentivize those people with money as well. The people that you want it to be a career, you need to incentivize with money. You need to pay enough so they will stay with the job. So before we move on from money, let's go around the room. We have a lot of experience in this room from one operator to, Daniel, where are you? 50 some odd locations? Yes. All right, so we have at least from one to 50 that I'm aware of in this, in this room. Will somebody be willing to contribute to this, just raise your hand, as to how they pay their managers, base and bonus? Somebody want to contribute here? Anybody? Then Daniel, we're calling on you. <laughs> Daniel, if you would stand, I'll be able to hear you. The people behind you will not, but I will repeat what you have said. And Daniel, you, you and I just met this morning. We don't know each other from, from another Daniel. <laughs> and what Daniel just said is 80% of their pay is, ba is a base pay, and 20% of their pay is based, on bon uh, is, is based on controllables, is a bonus. And he said he bases that on food cost, labor cost, and sales. Oh, cool. We got a formula going on here, my man. Daniel has been in the business since 1982. He could be teaching this seminar today, all right? So there's a little bit of a formula here that we can discover. All right, Daniel, thank you very much. Let's give me a little bit of a hand here. Yeah. I, another brave soul. Come on, somebody here brave enough to do it or I'm gonna have to call. Okay, right over here. Roy. Thank you, Roy. Uh, his question is whether the 20% on bonus takes into account inflation, the rise on food, and so forth. Yes, I would imagine every, every time that you adjust your menu prices or any time there's a new cost, such as minimum wage going up, you're going to have to look at those numbers and re-identify. In California, the minimum wage is going up a dollar a year every year until it gets to 15 bucks an hour. And then they'll probably do the same thing until it gets to 20. So what we have to do is every January, we have to reassess those numbers. Yes? We have to look and see what the new ideal inventory is. I'm sorry, the new ideal food cost is based on the new menu prices. What the new labor is going to be based on the new menu prices and change the parameters accordingly. All right. Generally speaking, I don't adjust the sales for CPI. In other words, if I have a 5% menu increase, I recognize that I'm going to have some attrition in my customers. So I do not debit the, uh, the bonus program as a result of that. It's still apples with apples. I don't say, well, we went up 5%, so you should go up 5% in sales. So we just keep that the same. Thank you for your question, Roy. Somebody else had a hand up over here. So, yeah. so I'm nowhere near what you guys. I basically pay him a set salary. Okay. Uh, my manager makes, and based on our sales, our sales is right around a million dollars. All right. So my manager makes about 45000 All right. He gets three weeks paid vacation, and he gets full health benefits for him and his family. So you pay attention. All right. So Mike has taken a little bit different av avenue here. He does about a million bucks in sales. His manager makes about $45,000 on a base pay. And rather than doing a bonus program, he has incentivized them. He actually does get a couple thousand dollars Christmas bonus. Okay, Christmas bonus. Arbitrary, just give it to him? Uh, yeah. Okay, arbitrary Christmas bonus. Feel good, end of the year. Spread the wealth around. Beautiful. Thank you, Mike. And his incentive is the fact that he's giving health insurance to the manager and their entire family. And he's also given three weeks paid vacation. How many of us can afford to send our manager away for three weeks a year? Oh, you're groaning. <laughs> well done, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> that was the other question that came up when we're talking about when Pizza and Expo and I were talking about this subject. And that is, are you giving benefits over and above pay? My answer to that question is only what the government, federal or state, requires of me. That's an interesting concept. In other words, I'm not utilizing 401ks. I'm not utilizing vacation. I'm not utilizing health benefits as a way to keep people. I'm sure every one of the people working for me would love if I was able to do that. But since I don't, 
The question is, what does the government require? So in California, every year they add to what is required uh, that you give for benefits. So I just follow that structure, whether it's Obamacare or anything else, you follow the structure and say, this is what I'm, I'm forced to do, so we'll add that. Therefore, it's not a benefit like Mike has described his. Mike is using that as a way to incentivize that person to stay with him long term. Well done. Anybody else like to contribute here? Right here. An extra percent of sales, 1% of, of the total sales. Okay, so David uh, David does this exact thing. No, you let, you know, pay a different okay, so the, the base pay is a little bit different. 2%, but the, yeah, the bonus is based on percentage of sales okay. increase for this percent of sales from last year. All right, so, so if they go up 10%, one percentage point of the of the top line. Yeah. Okay, great. So that's a bonus program, and it's directly directly to sales. So rather than coming up with a, a percentage increase and then just having a flat dollar rate for it, he said, if you hit this ten percent, I'm going to give you one percent of the top line. Another great way to do it. So see the creativity that comes out of that. Structure is the same. Structure is the same, and that is provide them with a base pay and a monetary bonus that can be up to 20% of that base pay. That's the structure that we're working on here. All righty, any questions before we move on from money? Yes, sir. Okay, his question has to do with the 4%. What if you have multiple managers? You have a general manager and an assistant general manager. Let me ask you a question, sir. What's your name? Chris. Chris, Chris the Assistant general manager, obviously, is a full-time employee. Are you looking for them to make a career out of it and become a general manager? Not necessarily, all right. So when you are working with that team, who are your direct reports? Do both of them report directly to you, or does the assistant report to the general manager? The assistant is reporting to the general manager. So, so Chris, in your case, I'll go back to what we talked about at the very start, and that is my recommendation is that your monetary bonus system is going directly to just that general manager. All right, And if that means they make substantially more than the assistant general manager, so be it. That is your direct report. That's the person you're putting all of your trust, your hopes, your dreams into as they structure those walls. So the assistant general manager needs to get some of these other things, the opportunity to grow into that other position. And possibly some incentives that don't have to do with money that are less expensive for you. I would put my money into the person who I, need, I was putting my trust in to run that location. The ex some exceptions to that is when you get into two million, three million, four million, the responsibility level of that AGM, that assistant general manager, rises quite a bit, doesn't it? Okay, so, so there will be consideration, let's say two million on, where you may need to consider some throwing some money that way also. But may, please make a big difference in how you do that. If, if, if the potential for one is, is $1,000 a month, then you make the potential for the other 200 a month. All right. make, make it separate so you know who's in charge, who's, who's the, where the buck stops, Chris. Thank you. Any other questions on money? Right here. Boy, that's a nice bait and switch for your poor manager. So what, what he says, he says, okay, you identify a goal of 25% for labor costs, and they're hitting it every single month like clockwork. Do you then reduce it to 24%? No. <laughs> there, that's the answer to your question. You keep it at 25, and they're earning their bonus is the answer. To, to delve into that a little bit more, not too many single unit pizzerias utilize ideal inventory. It's a lot of work. I recommend it. Uh, if anybody knows Big Dave, actual yeah, actual versus theoretical, so you're ideal. Uh, we're over five pounds of cheese. We're short 20 pounds of pepperoni. We're, 
Yeah, so you're setting that up. It's a lot of work, but it is worthwhile. Because what will happen then is you'll know what your ideal food cost is. And you can model your bonus program based on that ideal food cost. So you would never even consider lowering it. Because what would lowering it do? Steal from your customer. Thank you very much. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Uh, I, I had the advantage of learning from Tom Monahan back in the early 1980s as, as a Domino's manager. And what I learned from Tom Monahan's system at the time is that the food cost had to be within half a percent. In other words, if you were too low, you did not bonus. Why is that? He didn't want the managers cheating the customer. He wanted a consistent product to go out all the time. So when a manager is getting the, the number month in and month out, I might even adjust the program to say, boy, you do this six months in a row and you get an extra bonus because of the consistency that you're providing. All right, excellent question, thank you. Anything further, yes, sir? His question has to do with labor costs and whether I do that off of a number of hours or off of a labor cost percentage. Both will work well. We happen to do it off labor cost percentage and we have a range. So let's say that, that uh, we start at, in our case, 28%. So from 27 to 28%, they might get 50 bucks or 100 bucks, whatever we start with. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, once a month. Yes, once a month is a bonus program. So then you go down between 26 and 27%. Might go up 50 bucks. 25 to 26 goes up another 50. So that's where I would get the structure of that. Or it may go up 100 each time. Uh, so you can build that structure. And how, depending on the total amount of bonus you want to give, the chances are, obviously, the manager of the higher volume location is going to have a much better chance of bonusing based on labor cost because sales forgive, don't they? <laughs> so that, that, is, that is the truth, and so it's gonna be skewed. Your higher volume managers have, have a higher potential for bonus. Nonetheless, I've had people in lower volume locations kill it on labor and do better than somebody in a higher volume location. It's, it's still possible on how hard they will work. Further questions on money. Excellent, thank you. Okay, we're gonna talk about opportunity. If somebody came to me and said, Dan, what if there was one thing that you could pick in your 35 years of working in the pizza business, if there was one thing you could pick that was the most important thing to do with people, what would that be? This is the answer to that question. I would promote from within. For those of you who haven't heard me say this before, in 35 years, hiring a manager from outside of the company, I have been able to keep them a maximum of two years. Compare that to an average of over 10 years with people who are promoted from within. It's a no-brainer. And here's why. For those of you who haven't experienced, some of you have ex experienced this and you know exactly what I'm talking about, but here's why it works. Number one, the only people that I'm giving the opportunity to manage are the people who have proved themselves to me. Where? On the job. They've already proven to me the most important factor that they care, because my gut is telling me that they care. I can see it in how they work every day, they care. Those are the people I wanna give the opportunity to, because I can train and coach anything else in this business. It's not rocket science. I'll teach them everything else. But if they care, those are the people I'm gonna give the opportunity to. What happens when you promote from within? Well, Maria has been working there for two years, and so when she gets promoted, the crew is used to working with her. You don't turn the crew, you keep the people. That's what this is all about, is keeping people. A lot of people say, oh, what's the biggest headache you have in this business? And, they, and the first thing that a lot of operators say is the people problems. I don't feel that. I don't feel that at all. Yes, there are people problems, but they don't bother me. The, the, the managers who are taking over have worked with this crew for a long time, and they'll know what to forgive, what not to forgive, when to keep people, when not to keep people, because they know they've, they've grown up in the business with this crew. So we know that selecting people who have been there disrupts the business less. You bring in a new manager to a, a crew that's already there, what happens? 
Yeah, a lot of people quit. Oh, you changed my schedule. Yeah, I don't like the way you talk to me. They quit. You lose people that, that knew, that had skills within that restaurant. They might have been a great employee, they might have been a bad employee, but they had skills. When you lose skills, it costs money to replace those skills. So promoting from within solves that problem. What do you get when you hire from somebody from outside? You get somebody who gets paid higher, who has no knowledge of your business, has not demonstrated any bit of caring for your business whatsoever. There's no trust whatsoever. The reason you think you're doing it is to short step your job, your work, right? Because you're thinking, I don't got to train anybody. That's bull. You got more training with somebody you hire from outside because they think they know what they're doing. And generally speaking, they don't. They don't know your systems. And so they're going to come in, they're going to put in their methods. Now, there's a chance you might learn from them. They're an expert. They've been managing for years. They, they understand how to do it. You might learn from them, but there's a bigger chance they're going to disrupt your operation and you're going to end up terminating them within two years. Maybe I heard somebody earlier within one week. <laughs> okay. And by the way, when Brandon terminated the general manager he hired from outside within one week, where did he turn? to his lead server that showed she, was, she cared every day, put her in charge, now she runs the organization for him. Hey, <laughs> beautiful story, because that's exactly what it's about, promoting from within. The one thing, the most important thing I could, if you walk out of this room with nothing else, that's what you want to do. But here's the problem. The problem is you don't know what they know, right? And the chances are they know absolutely nothing about managing people. That's okay, because we're gonna talk about what to do with those folks. That's what this is about. What do we do with people that we put in charge who know nothing about managing people, who know nothing about running numbers, who know nothing about making pizza? We've gotta teach all of that, don't we? We have that responsibility to teach them how to be a manager. But they, if, if you give that opportunity, Managers want more. They want that opportunity. And by the way, when you promote somebody from within, what does the rest of the crew say? Wow, that could be me someday. Right? There is opportunity in this company for me to be promoted. And they're not going to sidestep my caring and my skills by bringing in some schmuck from outside who doesn't know anything about this pizzeria. Okay. When you look at opportunity, what happens in this business is some people will do this in a year, some people might take 10 years, but you begin with one location. And if you are successful, if you are successful, at some point you consider a second location. And that second location is a challenge because now you've got to do the same thing all over again, don't you? Do you got to duplicate everything you started out with? No. You don't even have to duplicate the work you put into the people. Why? Because if you go to a consecutive market, so if you're in Florida and go to California, all bets are off. But if you go to a consecutive market, 10 miles down the street, 20 miles down the street, 30 miles down the street, you can do what Big Dave again, one of my mentors in this business says, transplant your DNA. You've got your culture, your manager, your management team, the culture, your, your lead pizza maker, the culture in that first restaurant. All you got to do is take some key people, move them over here, and guess what? You don't got to do all that work again. And that provides opportunity. So it doesn't matter if you started this pizza, Ria, and it's going to take you five years to consider your second one. Some people will stick it out for that because they want to be part of that growth. Generally speaking, the people who care. If you're paying them enough money to stay in the job, They'll stick with you until you open that second location. And those are the people that you're going to want to, hey, first, they got to learn a new skill, right? Opening that second location. That's a challenge. I took a 10-year manager and opened a new location, and she got her ass kicked, right? It's very challenging to open a new location. You're hiring a whole new crew. You've got to give them that support. Well, that's the opportunity. When somebody sees, hey, I have opportunity within this company, I don't have to leave. Whenever I have lost, I, I lose people from management in two ways. One, I cannot control. When I lose somebody from management who says, I need a lifestyle change, I no longer want to work nights and weekends. Well, folks, I can't fix that. 
this business is nights and weekends. And so when I have somebody who comes to me and says, I just had a kid and I have this opportunity Monday through Friday, eight to five, I, I just have to shake their hand and say, thank you so much for everything you've done for me while working here. Because I can't compete with that. I have a job and that job needs nights and weekends. But when I lose somebody to anything else besides lifestyle change, I have to ask myself questions. And that's where I've come up with it. It's, it's because I've failed to provide that opportunity within my restaurant. Or maybe I've failed to provide that pay, right? These are components you have to keep with them, keep in order to keep these people. Okay. So when I go to multi-unit, that's a vision, a vision of the future. I don't know if you ever noticed, but when you start talking about your dreams of opening a second location and you share that with your existing management team, you can see their eyes light up. Why? Why would they care about the fact that you're opening the location? They want to be part of something, part of something that's growing, and they want to be part of the opportunity within that. They, they'll be, they'll, without even making them a partner in the business, just by working with them and providing the opportunity, you're going to recognize they are side by side with you, fighting to make that happen. The future. If you can paint a picture of your vision to your management team and talk about the future of where your company is going, and if you can do that on a regular basis so they can see it, They'll, they will paint themselves as part of that future. Best story I can give you this has nothing to do with the pizza business. It has to do with a girlfriend when I was in my early 20s. Girlfriend and I went on a vacation to Hawaii. And on that vacation, I was frantically scribbling notes about my future, about the things I wanted to accomplish in business, in education, the things that I wanted to do. And I did not include her in that. She watched. I thought I was getting away and, and focusing my mind on, on this future. I had a, I got a book to study on how to do it. I'm doing all this. And about, she didn't say a word. About a year later, she came to me and she said, that was the most hurtful thing that you've ever done to me. All right? And that's what the future, when we have a vision of our future, the people around us want to share in that vision. They want to be part of something. All right. And believe me, back to back, swords drawn, you and them against the world. That's what you'll get if you can paint a picture of the future for them. All right. So let's talk a little bit about opportunity as a group here. Anybody have stories about hiring <laughs> besides Brandon? Beautiful story, Brandon, about hiring a general manager from outside and whether that worked for them. I, I would love to hear a story where it did work for them, where that person came in and, and turned around that company and made things happen. Anybody have a story like that? Okay, right over here, sir. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, would, I would say that uh, this man is turning anything around. Wait, wait, I got, I got, you guys see how this man is dressed? <laughs> What's your name? Wayne. Wayne? Wayne. Wade. Blaine. Blaine. All right, he's a pizza slayer. Way to go, Blaine. <laughs> I'm sorry, go with your story. So I, I won't necessarily say that this manager you know, turned around what we were doing, but uh, several months ago, we engaged our management team six months ago, and I think we, uh, we would say that in a lot of instances, our managers were plugging themselves in the position. They were making pieces. They were you know, jumping in the kitchen. They were doing what needed to be done, but they were anchoring themselves down into crew positions. So we went, uh, we made an external hire for a guy who uh, had some pizza experience, uh, had some server experience, and what he brought to, to the table for us uh, is uh, a little bit of education to anchor himself down, to lock himself down into a crew position, uh, and, and what really shown our other managers the value of planning ahead, you know, having your strategic meeting, having, having your, uh, your position chart well laid out. And how long ago did he start with you? He started uh, within the last three months. Okay, so Blaine is talking about somebody who came into his organization and has some management experience already, not something they normally do. He said his current management team would spend too much time, for lack of a better term, making pizzas, all right? Doing the work 
and not managing. And so this person came in from outside of the company and the first thing they did is, is they were reluctant to do that work. They felt their efforts were stronger by managing. And the other managers in his company looked at that and felt they could learn from that. And that is exactly what I found with the people that I hire from outside of the company. They were reluctant to do the work. And that was a challenge. So they are bringing, you see how, what Blaine described, there are components, there's knowledge that, you're, that these people can bring in from outside that can enhance your company and possibly that you can learn from. The danger is whether that person, Blaine, one final question, on did you pay that person more than your current managers? Hmm. No, we brought in, he's, he's brought in a shift manager. Uh, he's he did that correctly. What he said is he's paying that person less than the general manager. So he is paying them the same as the rest of the shift supervisors though, correct? So not, not hiring on the ground floor. He came up a notch from that, but did not put them in his general manager. So here's an example. That person may have some success within the company if they can agree to sometimes do the work also. <laughs> so you'll have to keep an eye on that, right, Blaine? Excellent. Thank you, my pizza slayer. <laughs> All right, anybody else here? Story right here. Okay, so what Jeffrey is saying is that he is a product of a general manager who was brought in from the outside 10 years ago, and, and he's still with them, obviously. Okay, now he's worked his way up to partner. All right. that, is a, that is a unique story, Jeffrey, and well done. Congratulations to you. He has had no success bringing in people on the middle management level. Do you find that promoting from within is the way to hit that minute? That's been better for the middle management level. Uh, Jeffrey, what happens when you hire, give me one, give me a name of a general manager that you've hired in those 10 years that has worked out. What's his name or her name? Luke, you hired Luke. Okay, so Jer Jeremy came in, general manager, did end up lasting for three years before he left, uh, and did a good job while he was there. So good run, and you don't regret that at all. Okay, fantastic. So the other thing about this business, it is a little bit of a transitional business. In other words, it, we're, not, we're not creating careers for everybody. We'd like to create careers for that one person that we want to trust to watch those four walls while we drink margaritas on the beach. <laughs> Success story, Jeffrey. Thank you for sharing that with me. As I said, I learned from these as well. Anything further on opportunity, promoting from within? Examples where you, where you have promoted from within and you've been very successful with it. Anybody want to share their story on that? In Mexico? Yeah. Tell me about it. We, I have my, my first pizzeria, then uh, I opened another one, and put my host as the manager for that other pizzeria. So my one of my best wait, waiters, I, I moved in to my manager at the second pizzeria, at the second pizzeria, and then I opened another one. And the guy that made salads is the general manager now, and he's going to be the district manager now. All right. So David promoted a lead server to manage a, another location, and she failed. We're going to talk about that briefly. He all, so when she failed, he hired another lead person from that first restaurant, and that person became successful. And then for the third restaurant, the salad guy, and he's going to be this manager. Third restaurant, salad person, promoted to managing a restaurant, and now he's going to do multi-unit management. Great success story, and that's what I generally find most within this business. All right, so the third thing and more that the managers want is responsibility. How can we provide more responsibility within the restaurant? So let me give you just a, a general picture. I found myself training a new manager over the last six months. It takes me six months before I'm going to hand him the keys. Now, this guy's been with me for, 
I don't know, a couple of years, and I can't hand him the keys. I'm gonna personally train him for six months. So the first thing I start with is teaching him manager tasks, the weekly paperwork. When he gets that down, I go into scheduling. Teaching him scheduling and hand that over to him. <laughs> Turning over hiring and terminating people. That's something we hold close to our chests, isn't it? Hiring and terminating. Uh, service vendors. When a manager takes over a restaurant, I do not allow them to call the refrigeration repairman. They have to call me first. I want to know what the problem is. Sometimes I can solve it myself. There's a point where after education and training, I can turn that responsibility over to the manager. And believe me, the manager sees that. They're like, hey, wow, it's kind of a promotion. I, now I can go directly and call these service vendors and manage the restaurant. I see pictures, you can also, uh, I can email this PowerPoint to anybody who wants it, just pizzamandans.com, contact us, it'll get to me and say, hey, I want the PowerPoints. Maintenance. I think that maintenance is not easy, it can possibly be dangerous. Things in restaurants break on a daily basis. And so maintenance is something that, hey, they, first they just gotta call me, but eventually I can teach them how to fix that component. And believe me, when somebody, takes on the responsibility of the, of the equipment in their restaurant, that's beautiful. That's a manager been with me two, three years, now they can manage that portion of the business. They don't have to call me when their oven is broken. They may be able to fix it themselves or they may call the service vendor. Social media, turning that over to them. In other words, giving them the power to put things up that can be used by my social media management company to post. They can manage the social media right from within their own restaurant. In other words, uh, if I, if I, and one of my guys uh, does karaoke in his restaurant, and so he will take karaoke pictures and put those into our Google Drive docs that my social media team can grab from. So now he's managing not just the basics, but he's moving into managing the sales of that restaurant. And he has been one of the most successful sales increase managers over the last several years consistently raising sales higher than all the other managers because he will post to, to the social media and that gets used so his restaurant gets highlighted more often than the other ones. Outside the restaurant, what happens if you take your manager and you bring them over to another store to help train somebody new? More responsibility, right? And not only that, but you've identified them as an expert at something good enough to train another manager, somebody who's gonna be their peer. <coughs> so you can bring them outside of the restaurant. New stores, one of the most powerful things that we could possibly do when we open a new restaurant is take a lead pizza maker from one restaurant, bring them over to train new people. That is the responsibility, you're putting a responsibility burden on the people more than just reporting for their job. Anybody like to add anything on responsibility before we move on? Yes, sir. Yeah, his question has to do with whether res giving responsibility to crew members will motivate them as well. We are all motivated by being given responsibility because when I give responsibility to you, it means that I trust you. It also means that you're getting my personal attention because I'm gonna watch what you do and I'm probably gonna talk to you about what you do. So that elevates you and, and makes your life more interesting. That responsibility. And so my recommendation is, if you're going to be a manager for me, my job is to give you more responsibility. You as a manager, you wanna build your team, give them more responsibility. So no, I'm not going to be the person who takes your pizza maker and brings them to the other store. I'm gonna do that through you. All right. But even you coordinating that pizza maker to go to another store elevates you, doesn't it? You've gotta learn how to manage your restaurant on Friday night without that pizza maker for a little while. And you recognize you're doing it for the greater good. You're just like, oh, Dan took my best pizza maker on a Friday night because it could come across that way, right? I could just go to you and say, you know what? I'm stealing your pizza maker for the next two months because we're over in a new location. No different than coming to you in advance and saying, Devin saying, Devin, I need your help, all right? I'd like you to take on the responsibility of setting up a trainer for the new restaurant that's coming up. And you and I can talk about who the best person in your store is to do that, and then you can coordinate that. You see the power in that, the responsibility. Well done. Question, right back here.
His question is whether I would go outside of the four walls and give responsibility to uh, the manager to attend a BNI meeting or to attend a chamber of commerce meeting or to go to a local school and talk to them about the pizzeria. And the answer is absolutely. As a matter of fact, you and I could be a team on this because that is absolutely brilliant. It is a choice, however. What I have found is that in my particular case, the managers I've experimented with that did not find value in their time in doing those things. It doesn't surprise me because guess what? I haven't found value in my time in doing those things. So <laughs> I don't know if they're just following the leader or if we both come up with the same answer on our own. All right. But what they can do is they can step outside of those four walls and speak in the community. So when a manager, uh, I have my right hand man came in recently and he said, I want you to meet with the head of the foster children's care program in the county because I was talking to her the other day and we might have a match for community for community outreach with Pizza Man Dance. And sure enough, we set up a great program with that. So he brought that to me. Yes, those conversations outside of the four walls are more responsibility. And if you can even give them the lead on making that happen, even more powerful, right? Excellent. Any other questions right here? Chris's question is whether that 4% that we talked about at the beginning, 4% plus the bonus premium, whatever that money is, am I going to start adjusting that as I add more responsibility? No. Interesting. What I, what I propose to you, Chris, and to all of you is this. We all want more responsibility. We will grow. Our lives will be more interesting if we have more responsibility. We are not taking on that responsibility because we want to get paid more. The opportunity should be within the organization to get more money, yes, but that's through results measured in a bonus program. Now, you can incentivize this in other ways, though. As we talked earlier, non-monetary ways are fine. There, what happens if you put together this program, this training program, for a pizza maker to go over to my new location? And at the end of that program, I want to say thank you. That is what, I'm not going to say thank you by increasing your your paycheck or your bonus check. I might say thank you by giving you a dinner for you and your wife, a trip to Disneyland. That would be a thank you. And that's the way I would reward those. No, I would not have anything to do with the original money on that. Yes? Uh, his question is whether the 4% and the bonus program are incorporated into the prime cost. Prime cost means, in this case, let's say food and labor cost. So does the manager's salary, is the manager's salary included in the labor cost? Yes. Is the bonus included in the labor cost? No. I make that a COGS, cost of goods sold. That's down underneath, okay? Not prime costs. Thank you. Any other questions on responsibility? All right, we're going to move on to education. So, the last thing that the managers want, the managers who want more, is education. Because we grow when we learn. This is why people are in school, because they, people aren't in school because they're learning things that they can use in their jobs or in their life. It's because they're growing here, because they're learning things. They're learning more about the world. Well, this is what you want to do, except you're going to make it specific to your industry. There are some great requirements to do with education. We serve beer and wine. Requirement number one, the police require our management team to go to RBS, Responsible Beverage Service Training. It's a course. They go to it. Now it's required, but I am going to send that to, the, the last guy I sent to that, he looked at it as, wow, I'm really learning how to manage because I'm going to this seminar. He told everybody, I watched him tell everybody in the crew, he's like, I'm going to this. And, and by the way, you need to, you know, you can't call off sick that day because this is really important to me. And I saw how, how that empowered him saying, hey, I'm going for this education. There are other requirements. We all know food safety. 
Not the one you get online, but the eight hour course, food safety. They got to study, they have to pass, they get, they get the manual in advance. I found that the people who don't study in advance sometimes fail. It's not an easy test. You got to learn about all the bacteria and temperatures and everything else that you're just not going to know unless you study. So going to that course and passing it and putting that certificate right up on the wall for the health department to see empowers them. What are some other requirements in the state of California we have to do? Har harassment training, right? Now there are ways to do this. We could do it internally or we can bring in an outside expert, but it is required to train them on ha harassment prevention training. Did I say harassment training? Ooh. No. <laughs> harassment, the key word there, harassment, prevention training, thank you. So there are some required examples. These are examples of education within our business that are required, but trust me, you don't wanna grumble when you see these requirements come up, you wanna embrace them because it is education for this person. We know it, we've been in it long enough or we lived through it. We care about it enough to care about whether we're killing our customers with the wrong temperature. But somebody who has not done this before, has not been responsibility for that food temperature, doesn't necessarily know that. They don't know what the results are of food poisoning. Maybe they've never had it or don't know how they can get it. All right, <laughs> here's a good one, Pizza Expo. So I've been doing this for 30 years, right? Bring your management team to a place where they can learn. How many of you are not owners in this room? Please look around at those hands. I was talking to Peter here today. Peter came here of his own volition. His boss didn't send him here. He says, Pete's Expo, I'm there. <laughs> That's brilliant. When you can get your management team to, this is the most powerful education, I believe, in the world in pizza is Pizza Expo. And when you can get them to attend the seminars and get interested in learning here, they take back things you could never teach them because they're getting the power of the Pizza Expo behind that. When my guys go through the show floor and they see a, a better can opener or a better air curtain or just, they're learning things about, hey, it's not just what I have here in front of me. These are all the possibilities that are out here. This POS system does this. Why doesn't ours do that, right? They're seeing what's possible. So this is the best place in the world to do that. I encourage you as an owner to get as many of your management team members here as possible because you will be rewarded tenfold on that investment. Outside experts. So I have a weekly manager's meeting, two o'clock every Thursday. It's really an information dissemination meeting. But what happens is they listen to me all the time and they Eh, my voice starts to sound the same. <laughs> and so they may hear the information, but they're not digesting it the way I want them to. So one example that I use is every restaurant needs a safety, maintenance, and cleanliness inspection once a month, right? I mean, if you do that once a month, you're gonna have the cleanest restaurant in town because they get ready for a cleanliness inspection. So for years I did that. Well, then I found myself running out of time and it's once every two months or once every three months. Well, I, I was met with that challenge and I cannot walk away from the necessity to have that happen. So I hired an ex-health department employee who had retired and started his own business, ProTech Foods. There are many of these types of people in your communities who, who have taken on the responsibility. They go around and they, they do an inspection on the store. And you know what? They're even better than I am because they're checking things that I don't see when I walk in the restaurant every day. They're checking food temperature. They're checking everything the health department would, right? Food temperatures. Uh, whether you're putting raw food on top of prepped food, right? All of these things that the health department have discovered make people sick. They're, they're looking in the corners for dirt. And, and when this outside expert did the inspection, he came back to me and said, hey, Dan, here's your store inspections. And I quizzed my manager and I said, hey, how did that go? And they say, well, I don't know. You've got the inspection. So I went back to, guy's name is Danny. I said, Danny, you missed the whole point here. Your job isn't to inspect my restaurant. Your job is to be an outside expert, to teach my manager about food safety, about cleanliness, about maintenance, that duct tape is not a maintenance item. <laughs> Your job is to identify those things. Sit down with that manager at the end of the inspection and teach them what you saw. That's your job. And he's done it ever since, brilliant. So bringing in somebody from the outside. I got sued in the labor board for, for somebody not getting their breaks. And 
in, the, in that process, I agreed to it. I said, yeah, I'll pay. We obviously didn't pay for your breaks. Here's how much money I owe. Here's the check. Because I'm going to learn from this with everybody else. Oh, by the way, attorney for the ex-employee, I want to hire you. And I hired her to teach us how to make sure that never happens again, right? An outside expert to come in to teach us what's important for labor code. I had her on board for about three years, and she developed enough of a culture in our company. I was finally able to turn that over to my own internal HR guy, but that's some knowledge, an attorney knowledge coming in from outside, outside experts. They will listen to that. <clears throat> One day workshops. We have in the past used Fred Pryor for this, and this is not something that I'm currently using, but I draw on my own personal experience. My owner and mentor who, who started me in this business, Roger with Rusty's Pizza, uh, he was very big on me getting skills to do my job from outside. So he didn't, he didn't ever sit down with me to teach me any of the skills. He, said, he identified though. He said, boy, you're terrible at organization. You need to go to a planning workshop. So he would do a one-day planning workshop, set that up for me, I would attend that, and I'd bring that knowledge back. I, the first Stephen Covey, anybody know Stephen Covey? Stephen Covey, RIP? Stephen Covey, a brilliant mind, teaches leadership, wrote the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And Stephen Covey, I got a chance to see Stephen Covey because Roger sent me to the workshop, a one-day workshop on leadership. So he identified areas that I was lacking and said, hey, go to this workshop, I'll pay for it, right? And I recommend that as a, as, as a, a final piece to this equation of education. All right, well, any questions on education? Oh, we have covered it, all right. So again, what we're looking at here is, is not somebody in front of you who has done this necessarily by design. I didn't sit down and say, here is how we're gonna keep people for 30 years. In fact, I recognize this is a transitional business, the restaurant business, and I'm going to lose people on a regular basis. I need systems so that people can come through and be successful. But we do wanna consider that one person that we are putting in charge of the, our four walls, that one person that we are trusting that really is our business partner, whether they're a partner on paper or not. And we want to invest in that person. That person wants more. They want money, enough money, so that they can keep the job. They want opportunity, opportunity to grow. They want you to give them responsibility. I was touched because I had one of my managers talk to me today saying, and we've had a problem with labor costs with the wages increasing. And we've had a real problem. And she reached out to me and says, how can I help the whole company on labor costs? Do you see that? She's reaching out to ask for responsibility. And finally, education. Because the people we are promoting from within, the most important thing I can share with you today, promoting from within, those people do not have the skills to manage people. It's our job to get them those skills. Ladies and gentlemen, have a fantastic expo. Thank you.